Um, my name is Stella and I am also a senior archaeologist with MOLA and I will be speaking about the archaeological investigations and its results on the Tideway site at Chambers Wharf. Um, Chambers Wharf, here marked as Site 17, um, is one of the main tunnel drive sites along the Tideway Tunnel. The site will be used to drive the main tunnel to Abbey Pumping Station in Stratford in the east um, and receive the main tunnel from Kirtling Street in the west. I'll try the laser, but I don't know if I can make it work. No, but I think it's pretty obvious. Um, it will also connect to Greenwich Pumping Station in the south. Um, So this is the outline of the site. The site is situated half a mile east from Tower Bridge and lies on the south bank of the Thames, bound by Lofty Street in the east, East Lane in the west and Chambers Street in the south. The Neckinger River is situated at close distance to the west. The main works on the site involve the construction of a temporary coffer dam over the foreshore and into the river, which has already taken place, and you can see here. Um, and it also involves the excavation of the tunnel shaft and an air treatment chamber on the land side, which is yet to begin. <coughs> so this is how the site looks currently at its current state. Um, the archaeological investigations that have so far taken place on the site um, involve foreshore surveys, an archaeological trench evaluation, and a series of watching briefs on various parts of the work. The, the main excavation of the shaft will commence, I believe, next year, and the top six metres um, will then be hand-excavated by molar archaeologists. The coffer dam area, which is only temporary while the works are ongoing, was infilled with sands and gravels, and all archaeological remains have been preserved in situ within the coffer dam area. And this is an image of the site um, before the tideway works started. As you can see, the site is, was un unoccupied with a jetty built <coughs> over part of the foreshore. Um, and the red line marks the outline of the whole site, including the foreshore. It, here, I think, it is not at its lowest tide, but most of the foreshore was sitting underneath the jetty, which has since then been demolished and now turned into the cofferdam area. Um, the archaeological works on the foreshore have been completed now and have involved a foreshore survey prior to the construction of the cofferdam, and intermittent visits during its construction. Mola also monitored the dredging and pipeline clearance that took place on the site. Most of the assets had been previously recorded by TAS, the TDP, and Wessex, and I've only picked up um, a few assets of specific archaeological significance that I'll be talking about today. So the earliest structure which was already known was an Anglo-Saxon fish trap. Eight um, round wood piles were seen partially submerged in the water in the south, north central part of the site. Um, as I said, these had been previously picked up, and Wessex, a few years ago, actually took a, a radiocarbon sample and dated to 640 to 690 AD. The fish trap. So in order to protect it from damage, since the coffer dam was built, the, coffer dam, um, the pile sheeting for the coffer dam actually needed to be changed, slightly altered, to incorporate the fish trap and not damage it. And sandbags were laid around it, and it was backfilled with sand, so it remained, pre pre remains preserved in situ. This is one of the two windlasses recorded underneath the jetty before construction started. Um, but, yeah, mainly um, the survey recorded remains of post-medieval date. These included a number of barge beds and hard-standing structures, as well as piles, nautical timbers, um, mainly showing evidence for shipbuilding and or breaking on the side. This is one of the barge beds recorded, as you can see the chalk there. Um, and another interesting find was this large mooring stone, stone found under the jetty. It was covered in graffiti, 
one of the graffitis actually um, had a date of 1789 on it, as you can see at the top. Um, the mooring stone, again, was on, on the pile lines, on the line of the piles, and had to be lifted and was slightly moved within the cofferdam area, again backfilled and remains in situ. Um, during the excavation of the pile lines, we observed mainly post-medieval deposits. We did some, some machine digging into the, the foreshore deposits. Um, however, all that we found within, it was only about a meter deep, and all we found was um, post-medieval deposits sitting on top of alluvium, and the post-medieval deposits mainly included um, evidence of maritime industrial debris, leather scraps, hair, and corking. And now I'll be coming to the um, land-based works that took place at Chambers Wharf. Um, here you can see the site, um, the land site, with still this jetty in place in the north. The blue circles represent the area of the shaft, and the blue rectangle in the east is the area of the ventilation chamber. So these two areas will be excavated completely. The pink lines... Um, are the geotechnical trenches that only they, that only measured about 1.5 meters in depth and were archaeologically monitored, and the red lines mark the archaeological trenches that were fully recorded and excavated. So this is the view um, of Trench Five, looking west with Tower Bridge in the back. Um, here you can see the trench from the top. Kerry is recording in the trench at about five meters depth already. Um, we had to wear harnesses and had to have a top man at all times to winch us out in an emergency situation. Here you can see the top man. We were also provided with gas monitors in the trench and the water in flux, especially at high tide, was also a major issue, even with the river wall still being in place a few meters north. Um, the earliest remains were unearthed in a sondage dug into the base of Trench 5, which is the um, east-west running trench um, right next, just south of the river wall. And the natural gravels were partially exposed in the sondage at approximately six metres below ground level. Here's Jason, our geoarchaeologist, taking samples of the alluvium. You can see the tins in, um, in the section. Um, Yeah, and the earliest finds that we found. So basically, here is another picture. The earliest structures found during the archaeological investigation included a chalk foundation, seen on the right, um, and a hollowed-out timber or dugout section of oak. Um, a sample of the timber was taken for radiocarbon dating and came back with a date between the 11th to 13th century. The area of the sondage was too small to fully understand the remains, but so far um, initial thoughts include possibly a drain, a lock boat, and what I think might be li likely, especially with having the chalk um, foundations next to it, that it could be part uh, uh, a mill chute as part of a tidal mill. At the site next door at Bermondsey Wall West, um, they found a channel that was partially infilled with chalk, which they thought might have been a mill race. So this might be related to it. The, the dates are very similar as well. So when we get to the excavation of the air ventilation cham chamber, hopefully, hopefully we will pick up more of it and understand it. Um, these are the remains of the earliest revetment. We found a series of revetments running into the running into the river um, while well, holding the river back. Um, and this one was the earliest one in the, picked up in the south of Trench 1, which was the north-south running trench. Um, and here you can see Cat cleaning up the back or the land landward elevation of it, which was approximately 1.5 metres high standing. It was of relatively crude construction and comprised an oak base plate with oak posts and planks and a whaling beam on top. A tie-back tie was holding it back um, with a lock bar at the top. 
Interesting were the dump layers or land reclamation layers to the south of the revetment, which revealed an important assemblage of death work produ production waste. This consisted of both kiln furniture and biscuit ware. Biscuit ware being the first stage of production where pots were fired but had not been glazed yet. Um, according to our pot specialist, the most likely source is the Rotherham Pot House, which was in operation from 1638 to 1663 making the date for the revetment of mid-17th century highly likely. This is the next revetment, which was situated about 1.5 metres north of the previous revetment. Um, and here you can see we're well recording the back or the land side of the revetment, again about a metre and a half standing. The revetment consisted again of oak posts sitting within a mortise and tenon joint within a base plate. The planks were made of soft wood, probably conifer. This is the same revetment. Here you can see it from the top. It was held, back, held in place by a land tie, which is back raising the revetment with a lock bar at the back. Interestingly, the back of the revetment was insulated with up to half a metre thick clay. And the use of puddle clay as insulation material is well known from canal construction in the post-medieval period, but is a highly unusual method on river walls, according to Damien, who's actually sitting in the audience, who is our timber specialist and will probably know more about this. Um, the latest timber revetment was found in the east-west running trench near the current river wall, and as it was running east-west, all you could be picked up was crude timber tied, tied bags, which were running along the entire trench, presumably back raising a substantial revetment to the north. This structure was dated to the late 17th to 18th century. One of the tie bags that is depicted here in this picture um, was actually a reused chip timber. It is a lower frame timber in a large carver built ship and was sawn in half lengthways. An elm pipe was also reco recorded as part of this structure. It was probably carrying wastewater into the Thames. You can see Terry here recording the pipe. Um, the next picture again shows the cut off part of the elm pipe sticking out of the section in the north. And behind it, you can see a north-south running revetment, which may have been part of the same revetment, um, but as it is running north-south now, may represent a dock inlet um, of sorts. Here you can see both sides of the dock revetment. Um, Vicky, at the, on the left, is cleaning... Um, the land side of the revetment, standing about two metres tall, and Kat is cleaning the front or dock side on the right. Um, the inlet was filled with thick layers of made, uh, made up of maritime industrial debris, including leather scraps, air and corking material. This is Damien recording one of the timbers that was found during the watching brief phase, right next to the current river wall, the brick river wall, um, coming out of the ground, not in, we don't think in situ, but probably dumped, forming part of the latest timber revetment. Um, these are the, the, the timbers um, which we think might, would have been part of a ship pump. As you can see, um, you can see the tongue and groove um, technology on the sides, which fits nicely into each other. But at the base of the um, posts is a mortise joint. So we think it would have been reused, even though it, it, might, it is quite likely to be a ship pump made out of um, tropical hardwood. It was reused in one of the revetments sitting within a base plate. Um, these are some of the finds that we've retrieved from the, from the land reclamation dams behind the revetment. Um, these include a post-medieval sundial, believed to be of maritime, for maritime navigation, 
Um, we also find, found five coins or tokens on the site, inclu including a Nuremberg Jetton made of copper with the inscription of Gottes Segen macht reich, um, meaning God's blessing makes riches. Another find was the belt buckle you can see on the picture, a dress accessory known from the 15th century and earlier context in London, and a small lead weight at the bottom of the picture with um, a stylized image of a ship with single mast on the front, probably depicting a medieval cork, a Frisian-type boat that continued to be used by the Hansa merchants. Um, apart from that, we found large quantities of the usual expected finds, made a lot of leather, um, lots of metal items, building material, pottery, and animal bone. The latest remains recorded relate to the industrial past of the site. Um, Gold's map of 1887 shows the area of the site occupied by granaries and flour warehouses. It also shows a steam boiler in the area of the shaft. I can't really get the laser to work. So maybe, ah, oh, that's it. So basically, here, when you zoom in, it says steam boiler on it. It becomes um, interesting later on. Steam boiler, the majority of the site, this is pretty much the outline, um, was mainly granaries um, and flower warehouses. This is one of a number of saddle stones that we picked up just under the surface, the current um, surface, and these are probably footings for the granaries. Um, we found a series of those, however, no structure, no other walls attached or anything to it. Um, uh, the other way. And here, that's when I'm coming back to the boiler house, here you can see a structure. Um, a brick built structure with a large central shaft that measured seven meters in diameter by five meters deep. Little evidence for its use was found within the structure. However, we think it might be a new common engine, first designed in the early 18th century, which would have functioned as a, so basically the structure functioning as a boiler with a shaft used to heat the water and produce steam. Yeah, and that's it in terms of archaeological findings on the site so far. Works will resume next year. This will then involve the archaeological ex hand excavation of the shaft and ventilation chamber, um, and this will hopefully take place next year sometime.